Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. Woo. How, how many of you have heard of diversibility before? <laughs> Excellent. And how many of you have come to our events before? Okay. Okay. There's time. Uh, so I thought what I would do is share a little bit about my why, why I started Diversibility, and then talk a little bit about what we do. And uh, there's a reason why these two wonderful ladies are here as well. Um, but pretty much my story begins about 20 years ago. It's Thanksgiving weekend, and my family is dropping my mom off at the airport. And on the way home, my dad has a seizure, and he loses control of the car. And the next thing I know, I'm being like, I don't know, he just like had a spasm and we shot across the highway. And when I regained consciousness, I was in a helicopter on my way to the hospital. I ended up spending three weeks there. Uh, I broke a couple bones in my legs. I was in a wheelchair for four months. And I stretched the nerves in my arm, uh, which I still have to this day. It's called brachial plexus palsy. But I think the hardest part about this whole situation was, A, it's Thanksgiving weekend, so we're spending this time really thinking about how grateful we are about everything in our lives. My dad's birthday is November 28th, which was that Saturday, and the accident was November 29th, which actually ended up being the day that he passed away. Uh, so what ended up happening was, I, after this four months, I relearned how to write with my left hand, I went back to school, but I was thrust into an environment where I felt so isolated and alone. Not only was I still mourning the loss of my, in my family and, and of my dad, but I had this whole new identity that I needed to get used to. And I was nine years old at the time, so my peers weren't that forgiving, and I had this mandatory physical education class, and in my mandatory physical education class, no one wanted me to be on their team. And it doesn't matter if you have a disability or not, but things like that can have a lasting impact on how we feel like we can contribute to society. So I, always, I hit, I did, the, that's the only thing I knew I could do. I wore long sleeves all the time. And anytime anyone would ask me about my arm, I would start crying and getting emotional because there was just so much attached to what had happened behind the arm. Um, and so growing up, I always felt like disability was this elephant in the room. No one talked about it, no one acknowledged it, and I think part of it is this fear of getting something wrong or saying something offensive. But, uh, but when in reality, I think we just need to confront our discomfort, uh, have a conversation about it, and you know, ask questions. And so my solution was to create diversibility, or a social movement, or a social movement that uh, fosters community to connect, showcase, and empower people of all abilities doing amazing things. So I'm gonna go into each one of that connect, showcase, and empower in a little bit. Um, but I really think the problem that we're trying to solve here isn't disability. I think it's assumptions. Um, I think that so much of what we think about disability is rooted in assumptions. And what we really wanna do is we wanna change mindsets about what we think disability looks like. And so, uh, so our big thing and my big thing growing up was inclusion. I really fundamentally believe that everyone matters and everyone should feel like they belong no matter if you have a disability or not. So uh, the community is, uh, we have a robust community that exists online, but we take that community offline as well and host events in person to get people to connect. I think, so connect. <laughs> I think there's something really powerful that happens when you bring everyone into a room of all different types of abilities and get them to you know, share stories and get to know one another. And Rick Guadagni, who we uh, got to spend part of the weekend with, he talks about humanity. You know, Disability looks like me. Disability looks like many of you in the room today. Uh, it's not just this other that you know, we always talk about in, in like broad ideals. Uh, in terms of showcase, I think that there are some really amazing people in the community doing really amazing things. And you know, I have a couple of them here with me today. Uh, and so we, uh, over the past year, we've been able to showcase a lot of different amazing people within the community. And then finally, empower. And this is probably my favorite part of what we do is, you know, I think that there's something to be said about just giving someone the chance to do something. And oftentimes, and I find this even with myself, like there are things that I didn't think that I could do, but if I was, but if I just gave myself the chance, 
it opened up my mind into what I thought my own comfort zone was. Um, and so I just wanted to close by talking about kind of the three things that we think that we're a little bit innovative in. Uh, the first is we seek to unite the disability community. So I really appreciate this meetup in terms of trying to uh, accomplish this goal as well. But I think that the space is so fragmented and, there, and the spectrum of disability you know, ranges from visible to invisible that you know, oftentimes we're not united. The second thing we do is we want to engage people who don't have disabilities, some people call them allies, in, into the conversation. Um, I think that of course there's a need for self-advocacy organizations and support groups, but the real progress happens when everybody's a part of the conversation. And finally, we really want to celebrate this idea of disability pride and disability empowerment. I think, again, oftentimes when it comes to disability, it's about raising awareness or finding a cure or fixing something. When in reality, the people who live with disabilities are over one billion people of the, the population. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and for some of us, why, can't, why does it need to be a pity story? Um, and I really like this phrase, empowerment without pity, and kind of just living our lives to the best ability that we can. So with that, I will, um, I will close my opening remarks, I guess. And one of the things that we do with Diversability that's become one of our most popular events is we host an event called Diversability Unplugged Lightning Talks where we give anyone in the community, disability or not, five minutes to either share their story, share something they're working on across broad themes. It could be mental health, it could be entrepreneurship, tech inclusion, inclusion in general. Um, and so I thought that we would give you a little bit of a taste of what our Diversibility Lightning Talks look like. So with that, I will welcome Pritha who is here. She's our third panelist. And uh, let's pull up a chair yeah, just for you. This chair. Oh, is this okay? Yeah. Great. Oh, good. Oh, feel yeah. free to move my arms and legs. Does anyone have any questions while they get set up? Hi. 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 Oh, yeah, I'm happy to hear. Uh, do you all have any um, work in the like, uh, political field or like advocacy on like the policies? So uh, that's a great question. I think uh, to repeat it again. Um, I think that uh, Thomas asked if we do any work in the political realm, and I think we, we eventually will dabble a little bit in it, but kind of on this whole point of you know, trying to advocate for policy or disability employment or the ADA, I think we just wanted to celebrate the social aspect of disability. <laughs> oh, and then the last thing I'll say, I, I apologize. The last thing I'll say is that, you know, I think across social media platforms, we reach over 100,000 people a week, uh, and we have like about 5,000 followers, and we've won awards, we won the National Rehabilitation Association Bell Grieve Award, but I think what really matters to me are the stories that are coming out of diversity and the people who have gotten to meet each other. And in the past year, like, I didn't know any, any of our panelists. I didn't know most of you here, and uh, to be able to connect, I think, with so many of you has been really meaningful for me. Yeah. And Preetha and I are just meeting. Perfect. Although we feel like we know each other, I feel like through versatility. So. This is yes. our first like yes. Yes. yes, I know, <laughs> which is crazy. I don't feel like that at all. Um, if we could okay. just pause for one sure. moment, um, is the captioning um, just is the stream seems fairly slow, so I'm not sure if that's anything you can do. Do one of you I'm just going to try and refresh. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think I'm ready. Yeah, we're ready. Are you, are you nervous? No, I was just Oh, so then after the lightning talks, we're going to have a little panel about accessibility and inclusive design inspired by this meetup. Uh, and then we can we can open it up to Q and A. But so that pointing at me means okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Um, first of all, before <coughs> I, I get started, I just want to say it's really a really nice full circle moment to see Cameron again and be part of this 
um, because you guys should know, and he may not tell you because he's a humble guy, that he won the hackathon for uh, the Connectability Challenge, um, which was run by AT&T and NYU, and um, he rocked it. And he was one of the few people that actually talked to each one of us one-on-one -on -one and really took us aside and said, what do you need? How can I help? And um, so uh, I can say for me personally that I already had my eye on him because I could see that that extra love and TLC would, you know, was really, it was powerful for me to feel like, okay, this person really cares about us. And then obviously he did awesome things, so it helps. Um, anyway, so it's great to be here. Um, but, you know, I really would love to sort of piggyback on what Tiffany was saying about the elephant in the room. Because for me, uh, I had the exact opposite experience of Tiffany in that I always had my CP, or at least as far as I could remember. And my parents' approach was, yes, we're going to treat it as a practical consideration, but anything is possible. And therefore, when I wanted to be a ballerina, they just got me a ballerina costume for Halloween two years in a row. They never said, oh, Sean, that'll never be you, or stop dreaming. Or, um, and then when I switched from, ski, uh, from uh, actually, I started with a walker. When I switched from walker to uh, ski pole, uh, my dad was carrying the walker down like 57th Street and saw a ski shop. And they were, my parents were about to go skiing. And they were like, huh, okay. So she <laughs> took the walker into this uh, ski place and said, uh, do you think you could add skis to this? <laughs> and the guy was so touched by what my dad was doing that he actually did it for free. And as a result, I remember being basically pushed down the slopes <laughs> over and over. And I, I'm pretty sure that I fell quite a lot and enjoyed every moment of it. Um, but you know, when I can look back at it now, knowing uh, maybe how other parents might have handled it, I'm very grateful that they were always supportive and yet pushed me to do more. And but always made me feel that not only was I enough, but I, w I was special in the best possible way. Um, and I realized that in a way, it made the elephant in the room really tiny, but to the point where I don't know that I even really, in some ways, like if it wasn't practical, like I didn't want to really talk about it. So I never, um, joined disability advocacy groups because I thought that was the obvious thing to do. Here I am walking with these two, in this case, bright pink ski poles, you know, walking around like, you know, this is obvious already. We don't need to necessarily make it more than it is. But I didn't realize that other people with disabilities were having different experiences or struggling um, with things like body image. I certainly struggled as a girl and a woman and a, someone going through puberty, but as far as my disability, it was this always this ace up my sleeve. I felt like that was the easy part of my life. But I don't think I realized the importance of sharing my story until it happened. So I was a grant writer for a theater in New York about two years after college. Um, and six months into grant writing for them, they said, hey, by the way, would you like to write a monologue and be in our next show? And the topic was faith, which was really difficult for people. So it ended up being once a month we would submit for about two years. Um, but for some reason, every time I would go to write, I'd write about my body. And I didn't even really understand it myself until I started to write a story basically about this process of really realizing that my body was a temple. And, um, and one day when I was on the stage, it's literally like, the voice of God said, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And I was like, okay, what am I doing? I'm talking about my life, playing myself. Like, what does this mean? Does this mean like, I don't know, should I audition? So I went on an audition for ABC and shook my way through it. And I feel like the second part of that message was like, Sean, I don't want you to play somebody else right now. I want you to be yourself. So I ended up not long after that, um, pitching to the Dove campaign to include people with disabilities in their advertising. And the reason was that 
in that two-year writing process, I met some of the most talented, beautiful, amazing actors, uh, you know, award-winning playwrights, um, actor studio actors saying and writing in their journals, I hate my body, I hate my life. Um, and there were some members of that, there were about 15 members with disabilities, and that was the first moment that I realized, wait, not everybody thinks their disability is awesome, and why is that? And the first thing that it occurred to me was that I lived in this incredibly beautiful bubble where, you know, I was told anything was possible and I believed it. Um, so it made me realize that having parents and a supportive school system and all the supports that we can was really important in becoming the fullness of who we are. So it's interesting in this process of realizing the importance of my story. I grew that elephant. I want that elephant as big as possible now in my life, which is really strange if you think about how um, it started out. You know, it was like the smaller the better at be in the beginning, not because I had any shame around the disability, but, be but for me it was more important as a person to show that with a disability you can have a thriving, beautiful life. Mm. And I thought it was better to do that without necessarily being like, you know, obviously, duh, you know, here it is. I thought it would be better to just be who I am and put it out there. And now I can be that, but know that my story has a bigger meaning. Um, so, so that's really the impetus behind <coughs> the classes that I now teach, which are self-esteem related. And then even signing up for the Connectability Challenge. I'll be honest with you, I'm probably, of everyone here, like the least technologically <laughs> savvy. So I'll be learning a lot from you guys today. Um, but, but to know that my story mattered enough for this challenge to represent other people that you know, may have their hands full when walking or other people that have CP in, in this way um, was really like an honor for me. And, um, so my life has really expanded the bigger that I've let that elephant become, if that makes sense. So um, I think my five minutes are probably up. So. <laughs>
um, discusses and addresses all phases of the process of finding a job. So it starts out with um, the unfortunate inaccessibility of a lot of e-recruiting technology, moves on to the application process, moves on to the actual process of becoming a new hire, of um, getting the adaptations that you need to function in the office, but more importantly, to make that a non-issue where accessible technology is integrated into every part of the workspace so that anyone can come in and start right off the bat without needing to request certain accommodations or modifications. Um, so this has been a, a recent um, love of mine, I would say. I really am enjoying the work that I'm doing on it. But aside from that, I think tonight I'm going to spend a little time talking about myself from more of a personal angle, just to address why accessibility is so important to me and um, to put a bit of a human face behind it. So I uh, grew up in a household where my mother has the same disability that I do. And so in a way, disability was very much a fact of life. In another way, it was something that I rejected at every turn. Um, I hate to say this, but I used it when it was convenient for me. Uh, I worked it, and other times I wanted nothing to do with it, and the best compliment you could give me was, I forgot you were in a wheelchair. Um, moving forward, I started to realize that I couldn't go about life um, ignoring the elephant in the room. That seems to be the key phrase here tonight and realized that I could embrace it rather than, you know, outright reject who I was as a person. I mean, having a wheelchair attached to your butt all the time doesn't need to be a negative thing. It's just a part of who I am. And so uh, I started exploring my options as to how I would go about accepting myself, but I realized it's really difficult to accept yourself when it seems like the world around you doesn't yet accept you. And of course that has a lot to do with attitudes it has a lot to do with the discrimination that you face every day when you wake up in the morning you roll out of bed and people think you're amazing for doing that uh, when you get a job and people say wow I'm so inspired that you're working and on the flip side when they underestimate you you know when they say um, I don't think you can do that or you're incapable of doing this or you're worthless because you use a wheelchair so you come up against that but moreover you also come up against the actual barriers uh, whether it be a curb that's not cut out so my wheelchair can get over it, um, for people who are blind, maybe a website that's inaccessible to them. Just the little, I call them microaggressions. I hate to say that anyone's being aggressive towards me. I don't think that's really the case. But it's just that reminder, hey, you don't really belong here. And so I wanted to get into the field of activism but I wanted to do so in a way where I wasn't alienating people while explaining my needs to them. So I've come up with a bit of a motto or catchphrase that I would say explains the work that I do, and that it's if you want the world to be accessible to people with disabilities, then you're gonna have to make the idea surrounding disability accessible to the world. And I think that this particular meetup group is really important because you're taking ideas that affect daily life for many people and giving it a voice, putting momentum behind it. And that's where my work focuses, is that I don't want you to find, oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Okay, so exciting. Um, thank you. Wow, my new hero. <laughs> Anyway, um, I'll, I'll wrap up now uh, and chug, <laughs> chug some more water, but the, the long and short of it is that I believe that we need to make disability something that everyone can understand. It's often a very jargon-heavy um, little inner circle community, and we can move beyond that. We can talk about it in ways that make sense to everybody, and that includes accessible technology, too, because part of the work that I do with um, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology is focusing on how we can make everything plain language when we talk about it. Because otherwise, how is anybody going to know what we're talking about and how is anything going to be accessible if 
our requests to make things accessible are not accessible. So it really becomes a circle, and I ask people to think about that circle, to think about accessibility at all levels of a project, at all levels of interactions, because that's really where the change starts, when you think about it from the beginning and not when it's an afterthought. And I am going to leave you with that. And thank you again for all the water I feel spoiled. <laughs>
together happiness yet. And in this community, I was allowed to just be myself. In that space of being myself, I decided to apply um, for a number of, oh, am I doing, should I squeeze it more? Okay. Um, I decided to apply for a couple of fellowships and I was lucky to receive the Air New Voices Fellow in uh, 2015, which is a public media, public radio um, fellowship. Uh, and what I wanted to explore in that space was where are these stories of family caregivers? Um, I'm particularly looking at family caregivers that are, that are sort of erased. So I'm South Asian, I'm not married, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not a surgeon. That's really difficult for my community. Like that, that poses a lot of issues. Um, did I say I don't have children? That's just like very impossible. So largely, I had to parse because my family tends to be more conventional than other families. I had to parse in ways that were largely invisible, right? At the same time, I noticed that these other invisible caregivers were non cisgendered people transgendered people, LGBTQI people, but they, for example, had to resume their biological imperatives in their primary family structure, and that seemed kind of unfair. They had to exchange their identity between the ones that they had made for themselves as they grew into the adults that they are and the ones that they were required to be in order to be seen. So that was kind of troublesome. I wrote some stories, people liked it, they gave me a fellowship. At the same time, I realized the reason my dad and I literally went berserk was because we just didn't have the technology that we needed at hand to mitigate and exist in harmony with fear and hope, right? So what does that look like on a very basic level? My dad needs larger font, you guys. He's 75 years old, you know? Our caregivers might think, need things that are not just in English because they speak Creole and Portuguese as their primary tongues. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided, you know, I could probably maybe, because I'm not a technologist, uh, balsamic or pen and paper code this. And I did. And I made three things and they were pretty uh, used. Like all of my friends now with all of their ill family members are using this. I don't know, uh, I mean, I'm certainly not a, a programmer, but the question I had was like, how come things are not making uh, how come people are not making things that are like inc useful right away, right? So that's how I got into family caregiving technology. And I can say that in the diversibility community where I've met entrepreneurial friends like Quentin, soul friends like Priya and Tiffany, real life friends now like Sean and Emily, um, Christopher, uh, a number of other people, Everybody understands exactly what I'm talking about because what I'm talking about is accessibility. Here, I'm trying to access myself as my mother's new daughter, as my mother is my new mother. And my father is sort of, you know, his whole life he's sort of been like, well, so what are you going to do, you know, because you're not a lawyer or a surgeon. And now I finally feel that my father sees me in, in a way that he might have been waiting a very, very long time, you know, to, to sort of lay his eyes upon something and recognize. And I'm pretty certain I wouldn't have done that without this community. So that's, that's my story. That's it. Wonderful. Oh, thanks. So now that you guys all got a taste of lightning talk, what do you think? Good, right? Yeah. Terrifying. Terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, but but we love we love the opportunity to be able to give give people the opportunity <coughs> to talk about whatever they would like. And what you find is the diversity of stories and how rich they are and how colorful they are. But that said, uh, I thought that Pritha ended with a really good segue into my first question, which is I'd love to hear more a little bit about how you, Emily, and Sean you know, how you got involved with diversibility and, and kind of what that looks like for you now. They're looking at me. So, um, well, I think it's funny because I actually um, met Tiffany freezing our little uh, butts off um, at the Carrie Hammer fashion show. We were, they were delayed, so a bunch of us were outside waiting. And um, I, mean, I was having a conversation with another couple and she kind of joined in. And um, we exchanged cards, had coffee, and this was still something 
just on Tiffany's mind at that time. So I feel very honored that I would come in just before this incredible breakthrough for diversibility and it's grown so fast. Um, and it's really inspiring to see how we're all so different, but we're all united under this incredible sort of, I don't know if fellowship's the right word, but this incredible sense of community, this collective voice, but very individual at the same time. And, um, and so she had the launch, I don't know, maybe a month or, or so after we had our coffee, and I was actually supposed to speak with a certain lady to my right and we'd never met before but we met at the launch a week before we were supposed to meet and I think that's a really great example of how these unexpected connections and um, can happen but for me what's really impressed me is how the online community has just fostered this sense of we are not alone and and aggregating information I mean, it's a nice way to put it. No, I mean it's a. I mean, I don't mean to sound so technical because there, there's the heart component, but then you know, um, and then of course you know having people like somebody recently said you know I'm not having a good day today, and then you saw the armies of people go in and support him. So it's from that personal part to I think you know Tiffany posted a White House um, employment opportunity the same day. So there's, you know, this kind of, right, there's the informational, then there's the personal and the heart-driven. And I love that it has all of it, because that's what real life is, right? It's not just one thing. There's a lot of aspects to this. And accessibility, to me, is more than just stairs, elevators, and technology. It's also emotional, it's spiritual, it's, it's connecting interpersonally as well. And I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier, Emily, about this idea that, um, you know, really, if we don't make ourselves accessible and what we need accessible, then, and we don't communicate what we need, things won't happen. So I think diversibility is the perfect platform for that to happen. And, um, so that was long-winded how we met, but there you go. <laughs> Sure. I'll, um, can you hear me? Because the or if am I read it, yeah. rather. Okay. So I cannot, for the life of me, remember how I found out about diversibility. But I have this gut feeling that it had something to do with social media, which harkens to the fact that you better have accessible social media, because <laughs> if you can't read what's going on on social media, you're not going to know what's going on. Um, so th this has just been my singular focus for the last couple of months. Um, so anyway, I think I found out about it because of a tweet, because I've been on a personal mission for years now to find as much information about disability as I can. And um, as Sean said, we were supposed to guest speak together at an occupational therapy program. And I showed up for the night of the diversibility event, and I had just spoken to her, the stranger on the phone earlier that day, and it turned out to be her. And so I think as cheesy as it is, it points to the fact that the disability community is pretty small, um, but also gigantic. And so the work that people are doing in the accessibility field, in the advocacy field, is absolutely crucial. And having a central meeting point for that, like diversibility, is what drew me to it. And also, we do really cool things, um, too. I just, I think it's really awesome. That's, that's my personal plug, not my professional one. Um, it, yeah, I think what I mentioned before about it bringing a little bit of humanity to disability, that's so important because, I mean, I'm assuming, I hope it's a, a safe assumption that most of you spend a lot of time dealing in computers and coding and programming and, right, am I, am I safe in that assumption? <laughs> yeah, okay, I mean, I'm sure there are many other people who are just, um, you know, related to the field of accessibility in another way. But it's nice to step away from the computer and remind yourself that there's a real group of people who you're making a difference for. Right. And I think that's what's beautiful about diversibility is that it is an online community, but everything is about getting us together. So she was able, to, for, Tiffany was uh, posting about um, uh, the photo shoot with Rick 
And so this weekend, we all, it was like this big family reunion of all these amazing advocates in one place celebrating, you know, what we do together in this way and being, you know, really connected not only technologically but then physically. Um, and then I think you also posted about um, rock climbing. So it's all ultimately about getting us closer together and expanding our world at the same time. That's great. Yeah. That question was like kind of a plant so that I could feel, <laughs> I could feel better about what we're building here. <laughs> Yes. So, um, I found you through Eventbrite. People look into Eventbrite, right? And the I think I went to your second event, and that's when Quentin, a colleague of ours in the community who now lives on the West Coast, um, was doing one of these lightning talks, um, and uh, he got up and started talking about his child Stellan, who has requirements and. Uh, works with a number of therapists, uh, private and federal, and uh, you know how Quentin was having a really difficult time organizing that care, and then creating a space for those care providers to communicate with each other and capitalize on knowledge sharing and communion. Like you know, let's be homies in this because we're in this together. So he built the thing that I built for my mom and her care providers, but I did this in Frederick, Maryland when I was living with my parents, and he did this in Brooklyn with his wife. And it was so amazing to me that, to me, right out of the bat, this was like my, okay, the first three months when I returned to New York in 2015, I just drank a lot of gin and looked at the ceiling. And then I was like, okay, I had no more money for gin. I have to get a job. And so I, I resumed doing some, you know, whatever, consulting work and strategy stuff and started to go to a bunch of events, um, sober. And um, it was amazing to me that I met Quentin. But here's where it get, gets really much more amazing. Just about three weeks ago, the three of us, uh, or maybe four weeks ago, had lunch. Priya is holding the lovely yellow phone and um, she has had I'm just I'm gonna speak as I remember this um, her very own profound experience being a primary caregiver for one of her parents and then a, a, a primary caregiver who's geographically removed from that caregiving locus like where I am and essentially she's she if there was a continuum Priya has graced my future with her story. And she's at a place in her life where she's producing, are, are you live yet? Are you, can I talk about that? Yeah, you can. It'll be live probably the next week. But go for it. Well, why don't you go for it? Just do a little oh. side thing and say what it is. Does she need the microphone? Do you want the no, microphone? No, no, speak, speak up. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be launching a service, basically. It's, big, it's really a business. Um, and it focuses, it gives a space to the stories of adult child caregivers who cared for their parent or parents due to aging, illness, and or disability. Mm. Uh, with my particular experience, uh, it was all three. It was for my father, with my father, um, and there was a primary, secondary, and long distance caregiver and that really sort of impacted on how I view the world, the lens in which I view the world as well. And I wanted to create a space for this hidden population of individuals that I felt um, really needed a, a voice, needed to be seen, um, as much as the, the, the people that they were also taking care of as well. And my background has to do with disability studies, my master's is in that, and so it, was, it just sort of brought all of those components together along with background in theater, so. So I, I don't have any of these wonderful, ba I have useless backgrounds, but what I'm saying is that <laughs> it's, it's amazing, like how weird is that? The technology that I'm working on, I find in this group, the first time I meet the group, and the NPR stuff I'm working on, I find this incredible story, which is also my story, in this group, in this giant city. So. I think that it is really this issue that we are largely invisible to each other. 
our, our, our individual experience as we live them so individually, it's very difficult to find um, <clears throat> diversity, plurality, and acceptance, right? Um, and, and I think that diversity is, is a question, frankly, that, and, and, a, and a movement that should happen in every city and every town for everyone to figure out how we fit in through this lens. I mean, I, I sort of think this is the future lens. We're all, we're, we are all connected in this one place. That's great. Uh, I can have you guys do a five minute warning. Okay. So, I know. Um, so I, I just want to close with one question, but um, I really like to make these a little bit more interactive. So I have one question for the audience as well. So my question for you guys is I, I did want to touch on tech a little bit because we are here. <laughs> uh, the way that we're structured is we leverage, I say we leverage existing technology uh, to build our online community, et cetera. Um, but I wanted to know, at least from our panelists, like, are there any brands who have done a good job with design or any, any tech that you use that you really like? Yeah. <laughs> For my mom, I'll, uh, yeah. For um, lumin luminosity is excellent. Or like, what what is it about it that makes it that makes it like really great? So the um, tablet interface. My mother, uh, I I pushed iPad usage on her uh, pretty it, like 30 days into her event, um, and I felt it allowed her to capture some of her esteem and independence because um, she still was functional with her right hand. Um, and the more she played games that threateningly revealed the uh, sort of damage her brain has sustained, I think in that gaming atmosphere, it was sort of like a spoonful of sugar makes the process easier to digest. So while she was kind of completely unable to hold a pen and do spelling exercises, she was able to use her pointer and be a um, little less afraid that she couldn't remember how to spell the word bird, you know. And then soon enough, she was spelling ornithologist, right? But in the in the beginning, the the softness uh, of the iPad really helped my mother. Um, I think as a blogger. Um, I must say, and I would love to have suggestions about this, but I really enjoy using dictation software. Because oh, I use Lander. Ah! Well, we're both. Uh, we've done this twice together. Um, but no, 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 just the idea, because I would always say, but I can't write as fast as life happens. But I feel like I can kind of speak almost as fast as life happens. So that's been a real help in terms of daily emailing and things like that. But then I'm also an English major, and there's a lot of grammar things that come up when you when you do it that way. I always have to go back in and feel like a surgeon. And so, if anyone knows like um, dictation software that is also grammatically correct or ways to do that, I would love you forever. I already do, but I'll love you forever more. Um, so no, so for me personally, that's great. And then obviously with connectability, we had this incredible wealth and diversity of in incredible things that were created for that. And the grand prize winner was uh, a man who des designed something that allowed you to use the computer with facial expressions. And you could assign which expressions were for which. And you know, for spinal cord injury, for MS and many other disabilities, this is hugely helpful. Um, but since we have less than five minutes, I'm gonna have more two. <laughs> Shangi may enter. I uh, love the fact that uh, maps have dictation built into them. That's a, a novel concept, accessibility built into something. I love it. Yeah, so that's my answer to you. Um, you know, I can type pretty quickly, but I type all day, every day for work and for personal reasons. And um, I have severe carpal tunnel. And after a while, knowing that I can just hit a button and dictation will come on, I don't have to do anything fancy is a wonderful thing. Great. Uh, the, one, the one thing I'll say is I really appreciate technology that is 
really totally inclusive. So it's not meant for a specific disability or, or example. Um, and an example of that is this company called Bazalo. And what they do is they create this wireless charger that, you know, anybody wants a wireless phone charger. Uh, but if you happen to have, you know, aren't able to use your arms, being able to like push your phone close to a charger is pretty incredible. Um, so with that, I, I do, I just want to ask one question to the audience because Sean's like giving me the evil eye. But if, oh, you're, no. if you're building something, can you raise your hand? If you're building something, can you raise your hand? And then can I have you guys like in 140 characters or less, just tell me what you're building? Uh, Google Docs and Drive. Google Docs and Drive. Accessibility testing tools. Accessibility testing tools. Andy or uh, Thomas? Accessibility design and development guidelines. Accessibility or design. Accessible design. Accessible design and development guidelines. I do multimedia accessibility trainings with captions and audio descriptions. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to make my company website more accessible. Yeah, so you should talk to Cameron. Yeah. Uh, yes. Accessible websites and uh, making online services accessible for cognitive disabilities. Mm. Mm. Yeah? Um, so I'm working on a thesis um, and it's a tactile display for um, blind and, and visually impaired <coughs> people um, and it helps them be able to understand or better comprehend graphs. Mm. Oh, cool. It's for math and science. Oh, cool. I'm interested in making toys accessible for blind and blind parents. So, would also incorporate cognitive disabilities, or autism, um, or kids. It's great. Oh, nice. That may have been over 100. Can you see classes? We have to leave this room in two and a half. Hours. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Back there. I uh, work for Pearson, and I'm working on the Pearson system of courses to make it accessible. Making Pearson courses accessible. Wonderful. And um, an API with accessible information that's open data. Mm. It's great. Yeah. And I will close because we're going to get kicked out. Yes. Oh, one more, one more. Yeah, we are navigating, we're, we're deciding ways in which to navigate the city. Right. Navigate what? The city. Navigate the city. And so as you guys build your things, if we can help you showcase what you're building, let us know. We can blast it out on social. We can host an event or do a tech showcase or something. Can I plug something unrelated super quickly? Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. We'd love to hear about what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so connect